We turn our attention to what might be called the libertarian left, or more popularly, anarchism. This is the same logic shared by Marx and functioning libertarian socialist institutions, I think they are an interesting model that uh, I think is highly relevant. Academia and like how it has like 12 different names in a single thing. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> it's like, oh god, it's so annoying, mm -hmm. but I get it. Like, you know, if you read all this damn theory, you're gonna want to mention it. You don't want it to be as like useless as possible. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I mean you, know, you want it to be worth it. You just cram words in there. Yeah, it's like at some point I will be like Derrida, Foucault, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. <laughs> How would we actually start? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Theory-ish. My name is Paola. Oh, and I'm Hannah. Uh, this is the first installment of our podcast, if you do not hear our intro. Basically, we're two PhD students who really need to read theory and actually learn. Yeah, I desperately need more information in my brain. <laughs> I mean, we have information in our brains. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, theory doesn't tend to stick. So for today's reading, we did 1931's Walter Benjamin essay, A Short History of Photography. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. starting off, what'd you think? Yeah, I think it was good. I think it was like, it's really interesting. It's really like pertinent for today. I kind of was already familiar with this essay. It has been living in my brain mm -hmm. for about 10 years now <clears throat> since I started academia and started history of art courses. Walter Benjamin has been there, like my own personal ghost <laughs> haunting me, but I love him. So I think it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it's also why I recommend that I really needed to reread it. <laughs> it's been a really long time. So. You asked if it was Benjamin or Benjamin. Yeah, yeah. I was like, is it Benjamin or is it just Benjamin? Know, yeah. Well, okay, here's the thing. I never, we never really discussed his name. We were just kind of assigned his readings when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then I went to my master's here in London, but it was an American teaching my course. And he's like the most interesting man I've ever met. And he's like, well, to Benjamin. I was like, oh, I guess it's Benjamin from now on, baby. <laughs> so I, even if his name is Benjamin, I was like, I refuse. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard other people say Benjamin, so, you know, tomato, tomato. Is it Benjamin? I don't want to be like Walter Benjamin. And then people go, excuse me. <laughs> I think it also does sound nicer with your accent. Well, Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin. Benjamin. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's too East Coast. <laughs> All right, so this essay, as we said before, was published in 1931 mm -hmm. on the Literische Welt, which means the literary world. This is a precursor to Walter Benjamin's more famous essay, um, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which was published in 1935, just like four years later. So the reason I also chose this essay is because it's an introduction to the history of art concept of aura, which is extremely important, especially if you're dealing with the 1900s on. And also what I personally think is really important is sort of a writer philosopher discussing a mode of reproduction becoming an artistic practice but also existing within that skill and method. <laughs> Benjamin is a um, German philosopher, critical theorist, writer extraordinaire, mm -hmm. who predominantly published within the late World War I era throughout the uh, Weimar Republic. So um, he was also associated, but not a part of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, which included philosophers like Theodore Adorno, Marx Horkheimer, 
and Herbert Marcuse. Also, I think it's a really important note that um, Benjamin's essays, although there's not that many in comparison to his Frankfurt School uh, buddies, pals, colleagues, if you will, is because he died um, during Nazi-occupied Germany. So Benjamin is was a Jewish man at the end of the day, and he was a very well-known and popular Jewish man. So he did die in the 1940s from a self-administered dose of morphine to evade Nazi capture. Um, so I think this is also a really important background into his influence and why it's a little bit more limited because while the Frankfurt School was able to move to New York and like continue and flourish within like the art circles post-war, uh, Benjamin did not get that option. And I think uh, partly due to the notoriety of the Frankfurt School, we are able to still read Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And I think he truly deserves more recognition, especially after we discuss um, this essay. It's a weird one to choose. I think it's not one of his most famous ones. Obviously, like I said before, the work in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction is the most famous one. Also, his work on the arcades is really fascinating, but that's more like architecture art. But no, he's used a lot, but not really outside of history of art. And I think he has a bigger influence than most people would think. Mm -hmm. What do you What do you believe? I had never... Uh... I don't think I'd even heard of Walter Benjamin, which is very interesting because I actually use photography in my own, <laughs> in my own research, mm. but not in this kind of way. This is more like an art history thinking kind of way. G general thoughts, I think it's extra Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really, um, I think this is a really good way of seeing Marxism in process, right? Somebody mm -hmm. thinking through a Marxist lens and applying mm -hmm. it to something more specific, right? Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes I hear Marxism kind of thrown about abstractly. People love love to use the term, but I'm like, um, okay, how does that unfold in real life? Yeah, like an application mm -hmm. of it rather than just assuming that the reader already knows what they're on about. Yeah, yeah, showing, showing it in process, yeah. Um, I think, like I said before, it's really pertinent for today. You'll see as we as we talk about it, you know, I come from a sociological background, so I'm going to be like, mm, how can we use this today? Um, I can't help it. I've been taken over by sociology. <laughs> and it's short, but really dense. It's very girthy. <laughs> There's a lot to it. It's thick with knowledge. <laughs> Uh, I said it's it's savage, and I mean like in the colloquial way, not like <laughs> savage. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think it's very thoroughly honest, right? Mm. In a way that actually I wouldn't see a lot of UK based writers write. It's very like I said, it's honest. It's very this is how I think. <laughs> and I think um, partly the reason why this comes across it is because he's kind of, the Weimar Republic was a very interesting time for this sort of philosophical thought and development. I haven't really discussed it. My specialty, in I'm in the history department, mm -hmm. and I focus on um, the world wars in Germany. So you know, Weimar Republic is right between those two little wars, if you've heard of them. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, it's a really interesting time to sort of start discussing reproduction and basically the creation of a machine and new labor force, because this is post-First World War Germany. So they're witnessing the aftermaths of, like, mechanical advances in the effects of the factory and the war. For the first time ever, you're using mustard gas, you have trench warfare, you have flamethrowers being used for the first time, and while the American Civil War is known as the first photograph war, the First World War is the first time where you see behind the trenches men carrying their own cameras and they're coming back maimed, injured, and this is when you get 
advancement also in prosthetics. So you're seeing the effects of capitalism in a way mm -hmm. and capitalizing into new markets and the development of new markets and the development of new specializations and jobs all happening while a new system of government is being created. You know, the Kaiser abdicates at the end of the First World War and, you know, is he dies. Mm -hmm. So no more Kaiser Wilhelm, who is a fascinating man. Mm -hmm. I could talk about him for hours. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's the start of something new and it is equal parts exciting and also really frightening. Mm -hmm. So this is an age where you have a lot of open homosexuality at the same time with the rise of the like fascism mm -hmm. it's kind it's a really interesting time and i think that comes across in this essay where it's kind of trying to figure out exactly what to do with photography because it's called a short history of photography there's barely any history of photography no no i went in and i was like Okay, there's no history. <laughs> yeah, like he talks about Nipsa, Nipsa yeah. and Daguerre, who, uh, if you don't know, it's Nisafore Nipsa, who's the creator of the first ever photograph. Mm -hmm. It is Point uh, de Vue de Gras from 1826, and he's using heliography. This is where, once more, I'm a specialist. Oh my god. <laughs> so heliography was using a camera obscura, which is an old-fashioned camera. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. This is a short tangent. If you're interested in the daguerreotypes and all that stuff, look it up. I'm not the person. <laughs> My specialty is the 35 millimeter only. Um, but heliography is named after the sun god Helios because basically he used a camera obscura through using mirrors and tricks of light and exposure. You put um, the image that you're trying to cast onto a plate and then using the sun, you develop that photograph. So the camera obscura have been around since like Johannes Vermeer, a great painter, 10 out of 10. <laughs> but um, 20 years later, you get the daguerreotype, which is the faster version of this, mm -hmm. which is what I think most people associate with early photography. Yeah. Yeah, you've heard of daguerreotype, right? Yeah. So he does discuss like the early on usage of photography, especially within the quote, um, when Nipsa and Daguerre, after approximately 50 years of experiment, succeeded in doing this simultaneously, the state used the legal difficulties encountered by inventors over patent rights to assume control of the enterprise, thereby making it a public by covering its costs. Mm -hmm. So I think here he's like, obviously he's mentioning like the very early stages of it, but he's also immediately tying it with the privatization and immediately linking like, yes, this is the history of photography, but also this is the history of capitalism mm -hmm. digging its little, little hands mm -hmm. into a new form of reproduction. Yeah. Yeah. And this is like, you can see this throughout. I, if you hear my little shuffling, it's my papers. <laughs> <laughs> You can kind of see this throughout uh, the, the piece, this discussion of capitalism, the capitalist industry, I guess not capitalism specifically, but mm -hmm. speaking about how photography then becomes uh, introduced into this marketplace, I guess. Yeah, yeah if, uh, there's two direct quotes where he links this. So mm -hmm. one of them is, quote, not that this early period was not already full of market vendors and charlatans who were in, who mastered this new technique for the sake of profit. Indeed, they did so on a mass scale. And then later on, he also states, but the latter belonged to the fairground and its traditional arts, where photography has always been at home, rather than to industry. Industry conquered the field with the visiting card snapshot, the, its first manufacturer characteristically becoming a millionaire. So he's immediately linking it to even like smaller mom and pop shops of the time, kind of preying upon people um, with the concept of photography. And what I believed he was referring to here is the usage of spectral photography, mm -hmm. which um, with the daguerreotype, because of the method that's used to create that image, it has a lot of overlays, so you can manipulate the final product 
by laying two pieces mm -hmm. of photography on top of each other, making it look like the subject was in the presence of a ghost. Mm -hmm. So if your family member died, they could get a spectral photography of that person and be like, hey, look, there's Ma, like, right above me. And it's like... <laughs> Extremely cruel, yeah. <laughs> but it's also, hey, make a living, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's also really interesting, right? I don't... Maybe I wouldn't see it as cruel. That's just me. <laughs> because it's a way of connecting back to that person that's died. I think there's something also really interesting here about, you know, when I'm saying it seems really pertinent to today, you know, he says at one point that it's fundamentally related, and this quote, fundamentally related to the convulsions of capitalist industry, end quote. And I think there's something interesting to think about here, and we can think about this throughout, mm -hmm. about the development of photography kind of not only to serve a capitalist almost like material need, right? You want to put images out there. Everything's very image focused, mm -hmm. at least in kind of my, my context, your context, <laughs> but also almost like a, a neoliberal one, right? You want to seem, and we can go into neoliberalism in, in other episodes, <laughs> I will not do it here, but think about everything is focused on the individual, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is focused on the individual. That also means that things become the fault of the individual, and yeah. this is where the, the issue kind of happens. But also as an individual, you're meant to seem productive, and when you're putting out, say, images on Instagram, right, often these images are a very doctored version of your own life, right? You want to seem happy. You want to seem like you're doing stuff. You want to seem... <laughs> this is a really stupid example, right? But do you know when people soft launch their partners? Yeah. <laughs> I, I always think that's a really interesting phenomenon because they want to seem desirable without revealing who's desiring them. Right? Yeah, and we've gone off on a tangent. But no, I think, but I think, I think you're hitting on a really important point, which is the capitalism of authenticity, which links, funnily enough, I think, to the concept of aura. So the thing with this essay as well is that it's sort of everywhere for a really long time, and it's Benjamin Benjamin <laughs> setting up like the platform to introduce the concept of aura. Mm -hmm. So he's already talking about, oh, here's the factory and comparing the production of imagery to factories and the loss of like the touch mm -hmm. of authenticity. So he's talking about the fetishistic, fundamentally anti-technical notion of art with which theorists of photography have entrusted for almost a century without, of course, achieving the slightest result. A single sweep, this speech embraces the field of new technologies from astrophysics to philology. I think it's meant to say philosophy, that was my bad. <laughs> the prospect of stellar photography is adjoined by the idea of photographing a corpus of Egyptian hieroglyphs. So obviously here he's not actually talking about Egyptian hieroglyphs. He's talking about using the camera to reproduce something that's unique and authentic. So it's like when you're at a concert and you're recording the concert, it sounds better when you're at the concert, mm -hmm. not when you're recording it on your like iPhone or flip phone or whatever. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> they're coming back. They are coming back. The snap is missed. <laughs> but he's, he's like talking about like how this, you have that loss of authenticity because you're never going to be able to reproduce the exact feeling, the aura, the smell, and everything mm -hmm. of that moment via photography. But it is interesting to use. Mm -hmm. So I wrote here that he was using the Marxist term for commodity fetishism, in which the value is placed upon the production and exchanges, say, money and merchandise, and not the relationships established between producer and consumer. Value is placed upon the object, not upon the worker who created said object. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, I think Instagram is a great, great use of this, mm -hmm. is when people post these videos of something they've experienced, and it's obviously not them in the video, it's someone else, mm -hmm. but they get all the credit for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I that heard really them, yeah, a lot of Twitter comedians are like complaining about that kind of stuff. <laughs> but like, you know that account, F. Jerry? No. That, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> um, basically, it's this like now private account in which they do a lot of um, parody posting in which they take screenshots mm -hmm. or they ask 
permission, yeah, I'm doing air quotes, fellas, to post all these jokes and all that stuff. And they call themselves curators of content, but none of the content is theirs. Yeah, kind of like, do you know these quote pages that are mm. full of like inspirational quotes? It also reminds me, I can't remember this TikTok person's name, but I'm sure you know, and everybody will know. There was a TikToker who was doing like shot for shot of the people's TikToks, and he gained this massive following. And so to combat this, people would like, is it called Stitch? This person's mm-hmm. video. And they would like literally be over the person's video. So you can see them slightly in the background, mm. but they're essentially like stealing his content. Yeah. And so it becomes this like replication. Reproduction. Yeah, yeah, reproduction. Yeah, and it's like once you get to like the fifth stitch of this, it's like what is the original thing even? Yeah, what does it mean? Yeah, I can't believe we did like a Benjamin TikTok collab. <laughs> <laughs> We're huge TikTok people. I would say. <laughs> um, I do have an academic reference for this because oh, because yeah, okay. I'm more familiar with this sort of stuff. I did a little bit more <laughs> homework. <Yeah>. So <laughs> I wrote that this connection between creator of the image and the image of the machine itself is narrated in his uh, example of the Arago de Guerre case uh, within the actual text. Like, mm-hmm. you know how Benjamin was talking about how all these like scientists were actually vouching for the creation of the daguerreotype. And I think it was a really interesting little bit that it was only a couple sentences, but it can definitely be blown up more into being an entire field itself. This is this whole, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) and um, uh, John Tresh discusses this particular thing in his essay called The Daguerre's First Frame, Francois Argo's Moral Economy of Instruments. And his abstract for this essay reads, quote, Instead of celebrating detachment, instantaneity, transparency, and abstraction, Argo understands instruments and human citizens as dynamic mediators, which necessarily modify the forces they transmit, end quote. Mm -hmm. And this is a weird essay because it's sort of a philosophy essay being published in a scientific review. So it is one of those, like, Benjamin is a really interesting thing to read Because yes, it's talking about like photography and you can talk about photography as a scientific medium, but this is not a scientific essay, No. (laughs) but it can like lead, it can lean towards a scientific study. And I think it's why, like, I think it's endlessly fascinating and there's so much to it and people should like it more. (laughs) You're like, please stand Benjamin. (laughs) Yeah. I think another quote that I can add from Benjamin, we're going to do a lot of quotes of Benjamin and I will make sure to note it and yell it as clearly as possible because this is one of those essays that's just extremely confusing if you don't kind of sit with it for a bit. Yeah yeah and the other thing is in the kind of show notes in the description of the podcast you will be able to find a link to this essay Mm because it's freely available it's not a paywall. No, and I think Art Forum, which is the one I I shared with you, Mm -hmm. is a really good um, version of that essay. While it doesn't have the pictures that Benjamin does discuss, those can be found elsewhere because Benjamin does write it in. But the Art Forum version of this essay, one, it was updated in, I believe, 2015, so it's the most accurate translation of this essay that I found in a while. But it also gives you a good background into Benjamin and its connections to other essays. And I think that's extremely important if you're reading him for the first time. Yeah. So I want to sit with this, this idea of aura and a few other things that we want to discuss today about this kind of space between the photograph and life. And Mm -hmm. we can kind of discuss aura, but there's something really interesting about how people, and we were talking about authenticity, but how people think almost that a photograph or film is an accurate reflection of what is happening in life. And I don't just mean like in a fake news or this has been took in a certain way, but I mean, if you take a photograph of yourself, you're capturing like a still moment and it is a reflection of you, but it it doesn't capture all the life, all the thoughts, all the space in between, I guess. And There's something really interesting about reflecting on that space in between, especially as like this visual medium is such a heavy thing in our current 
everyday existence. Yeah, and I think the quote where he says, it is possible, for example, however roughly, to describe the way somebody walks, but it is impossible to say anything about the fraction of a second when a person starts to walk. Photography with its various aids, lenses, enlargements can reveal this moment. Photography makes aware for the first time the optical unconsciousness, just as psychoanalysis discloses the instinctual unconsciousness, end mm -hmm. quote. And I think here he is talking about, yeah, you can try to capture movement, but you can never capture movement accurately. You only get like frames per second. It's why it's called frames per second. You're not actually capturing the image or the actual motion. You're capturing instances of that motion that are stapled together to form film or to form a video. And in this, I introduced the painting by Marcel Duchamp called New Descending Staircase Number no. 2 from 1912, which is the most art history thing I could possibly pull. <laughs> it was like, immediately was like, <gasps> Marcel Duchamp. <laughs> you know? But there's, there's a reason why art historians like, use this at least I was taught this essay alongside paintings like this. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, you're going to think, oh my God, Paola, what are you showing us? Mm -hmm. This is not a new descending a staircase. And to that I say, you are kind of correct. This is Marcel Duchamp. He can do everything he wants. Mm -hmm. But this is part of like abstraction where like Benjamin is also hinting upon this. Painting is no longer incorporating reality it doesn't care about reality it cares about the emotions whatever sensation it wants to portray so i think new descending a staircase number two <laughs> kind it shows the way that the body moves in a very unable to be described ways so like someone walking down the stairs can look in many different ways someone doing it elegantly someone doing it kind of brutish yeah. you know so a new it, it, ca it tries to simulate the motion of this person going down, but it doesn't ever capture it. But instead, we can get the flurry of it. Mm -hmm. So what do you think when you look at this like type of painting? Oh, yeah. You showed me this earlier, and I was like, where's the puzzle? <laughs> <laughs> and then I look. I was standing it for a while, and I was like, oh, I see it. I do see it. Well, this also goes back to Benjamin's, the, the last very bit, and this is probably going too far ahead, but he does talk about like the importance of captioning an image and adding context to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not photography, but it's clothes. Do you know what it kind of reminds me of? Do you know this? Do you know when people used to like draw a stick man in the mm -hmm. corner of a page and then flip the page? Yeah. And they'd be a person like doing flips and stuff? It's kind of reminds me of that. <laughs> well, yeah, well, isn't that what a movie is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. just like little stills going. Broop. Yeah, but that's kind of what this is, right? Mm -hmm. But all in one picture. You well, yeah, it it, it's it's part of like I think some people's reading also of Picasso as different mm -hmm. opticals of the same thing, but uh, Picasso is a that's that's a hole we can go down <laughs> on another day. <laughs> but yeah, we also spoke earlier because we did have a little chat about this beforehand about I think it's useful yeah it is useful <laughs> we need to contain the thoughts into a solid movement <laughs> but you also kind of spoke about aura as a different kind of reproduction so we've been talking about the reproduction of movement of life of trying to capture something that's almost uncapturable right yeah but then you also spoke about if you take a picture of a painting there's something that's lost yeah. In that in that taking that picture of the painting. When you you know, I don't know if anybody's ever had it, but um we actually went to an art gallery recently and I, I stopped taking pictures of things in art galleries because I just feel like there's something lost. I don't like that. <laughs> well, I, I do because I do research on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless you're doing research. Yeah, but, yeah. And, and it's also usually I don't actually take pictures of the actual object or painting. Mm -hmm. I take a picture of how it sits in the space. Yeah, that's different. And yeah. people's relation to it. So I usually take pictures. I love people in my photos because I can see how people interact with it and how they move within the space. And you do museum studies. Yeah, yeah. You need to have people in your pictures. But then that's another different type of aura. We're trying to capture a fraction of what it means to be in that space, in which we can never truly get. And Benjamin uses aura in this way to describe the Marxist construction of commodity. And 
basically he's saying that by using the factory or a factory object, there is a loss of aura. So I always saw it as when you buy those ceramic mugs from like Morrison's or something, mm -hmm. and it's like handcrafted. It is not handcrafted. We all know it is not handcrafted, but it pretends it cosplays as like being handcrafted, yeah. but an actual handcrafted ceramic is going to have imperfections to it mm -hmm. it's gonna be dipped in like a weird way and like I don't actually I take it back I don't want to call it imperfections I think it's the unique and it's quirk and it's what makes that piece lovely and beautiful but if you have a reproduction it doesn't have any of that it is a perfect little thing and that is it and that's why we also put more value into something that is made by hand than something that is made by a machine and that's where I think photography is introduced but not where it ends up and that's the most interesting thing about this essay is that photography started off as that skill it was Daguerre it was uh Nipso. I don't know how to say his name I'm just gonna say it differently every single time and hopefully I'm correct once <laughs> But it's, it's using photography as a means to document, and it's very scientific. So in terms of connecting the surrealist uh, photography that's happening during the Weimar era, like Mahalinaj, and people that are using photography as its own artistic medium for political intent, like August Sanders, mm -hmm. there is a really good quote that I wanted to single out, and it's this. There are achievements of surrealist photography which presages a salutary estrangement between man and his environment, thus clearing the ground for the politically trained eye before which all intimacies serve the elimination of detail. So this at first sounds like a really good thing. You're like, oh yeah, using the camera to like take pictures for the political movements. Well, but Jimmy's like, uh, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And I think... His usage of August Sander both applauds the use of photography for political purposes, but he's not a fan of how the image is taken. So I selected, uh, let's use these two photographs. So one of them is called The Bricklayer from 1928, and the other one's called Young Farmers from 1914. So I chose these two images because one, they're 10 years apart. And I think two, it's different representations of class. So with the bricklayer, it is a beautiful shot. Like we have to, you have to give, you have to give it to Sanders. It's a beautiful, yeah, beautiful shot. Yeah, 1928 as well. Like, damn. Well, a good camera's a good camera. Yeah, yeah <laughs> probably a Leica. But it's basically a bricklayer holding a lot of bricks on his shoulders, posed with one fist on his hip and the other arm, kind of holding steady the brick. And he's very focused, looking directly at the camera. It's it's a purpose use of light because you kind of it's an abstracted image. You cannot see what's actually behind him. All you see is the brick layer, and artistically, it's meant to convey like it's supposed to highlight the working class person that we usually don't see. They're just part of the background. So with this juxtaposition of like the black with the brick layer you're kind of given this like isolated image and it's absolute fantasy. There's no way this bricklayer is gonna be posing for this shot. That is heavy, even if they're used to laying bricks. Like it is a lot to hold, but it produces a really interesting image that is captivating to us. And that's why we're talking about it right now. In the other image, which I think is much more fascinating, is Young Farmers 1914. And it is these three farmers depicted in I like to call it your Sunday best. Mm. They're in bourgeois like costume, each with like a cane and a hat. One of them has a little ciggy, you know, looking real dapper. Mm -hmm. And what I think is really interesting about this image is that they're walking around in this nice fine clothing, also stepping on mud and in the countryside. Yeah. Like where are they going? <laughs> <laughs> and what I also find so much more fascinating is that this is also the depiction of a new working class where the working class are being seen for the first time ever as like Marx discusses a lot in um, Das Kapital. It is the changing of class. Mm -hmm. So people going from working 
to petit bourgeoisie, and this is like a good description of it because I think the most important part of this, and please correct me if I'm wrong, via DMs, do not message me personally. I will not reply to emails. The vestiment that they have on is a little bit outdated already. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, Edwardian still technically. So if they wear it to a theater, it still looks fine, but they're trying to pretend to be bourgeois. But yeah, it's, it's not exactly there. I think the costume that they're wearing is like a little bit older, I think at least like five to 10 years earlier. And that makes sense. Cause this is, you know, 1914, there's a war going on. <laughs> so obviously you're not gonna have like the best clothing, but I think it's a really interesting thing to capture this false sense of authenticity. One in which, you know, Sanders uses that person as the working person in action, but he's not in action. Mm -hmm. He's posed. And then capturing these young farmers not dressed as farmers. So one of the things that I think is interesting in this, is it August Sander? Am I saying it? Yeah, I believe it. He's dead, it's fine. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Benjamin, Benjamin, listen. It is, it is Deutsch. It is Deutsch, it is Deutsch this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but Augustander, you know, it's, it's really interesting. We were talking about authenticity and stuff earlier. And one of the things that's interesting to think about is the manipulation of the image. Mm. And there's kind of, there's more than two sides to this. One of the things you were talking about that we can talk about in a minute is the manipulation of the actual image and the process that goes through, especially mm -hmm. during this time period. But one of the things I wanted to bring up was this manipulation of the people in the images. Mm. You know, think, we've been talking about Instagram, think posing, think putting things in the background. I don't know if people went through this during the whole pandemic period when everybody was on Zoom, but I don't know if anybody's changed their Zoom background to give us particular perception of them. I know so many academics were like, I have bookcases behind me <laughs> with very specific books because they changed their bookcases around. No, I can, <laughs> this is a complete side note, but mm -hmm. my MA thesis supervisor, I looked forward to our meetings on Zoom are on Microsoft Teams, <laughs> as uh, the UC of L's provides. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing the renovations happening in his house. Because <laughs> every single time something would move around, I'd be like, oh, he's working on something. And then eventually I think he caught on that we were all just like looking into his home. He was like, okay, now blurred. <laughs> yeah, I'm blurring. Yeah, uh, yeah. I really wanted to know how that house turned out. I might email him actually. Can you send me pictures of the inside of your <laughs> I, but only from the Zoom angle. He, listen, he, kn he knows where I'm at. He knows I'm far away from him. It's fine. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> um, but this is what I mean, mm. like manipulating the image. And there's an example, actually, that one of my students brought up. I used to teach um, a module called Media Audiences and Social Change. And in one of the weeks, we spoke about fake news and different kinds of fake news. And one of them brought up a photographer called Matthew Brady, who I believe was a US Civil War photographer, who took loads of images of the aftermath of, of conflicts with dead bodies in the in the images, just in case you go looking them up without me saying Yeah, that. huge trigger warning. Trigger warning. There are bodies. Um, but in a number of cases, actually, scenes were manipulated with cameramen physically arranging objects and debris and even dead bodies within the frame to make the scenes more hard-hitting, more mm -hmm. devastating, right? So you have this process of, you can't trust the image itself because the image itself is, you know, we were talking about aura, it's not a reflection of life but also the people in the image might be framed or, or put in a certain way to give a certain message right and then i think the other side that's interesting that you can speak way more about is <laughs> the manipulation that takes place in the development of a photograph and and things like that yeah yeah i think uh what's really interesting about these images because i have come across them and my specialty currently as i'm doing my phd is on photography specifically amateur photography, mm -hmm. which is a whole nother discussion that we're not going to get into today. But it is quite similar in that, yes, you can pose reality. You can 
edit reality quite physically and then hit the camera. There is like that Freudian connection with like the concept of a shot. Like you shoot a camera, it is a violent act. Within these photographs, you can definitely see like the posing of a body in real time to mimic reality and to actually, I would say mimic painting because you get um, a lot of paintings from the 1800s that show bodies and corpses. This is still during the time of the French Revolutionary period. <laughs> What's it called? The French Revolution. It's the called French the French Revolution. Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's well, it's also the Haitian um, yeah, Revolution. Yeah. So all these things are happening at the same time. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of advancements of technology, and there's people trying to depict pictorially this sort of violence mm -hmm. and of course it's extremely dramatized because they're trying to convey the drama and the gore and the horror of reality and of war. So here comes this new medium in which you can actually put the corpse into the photograph and you know what? Corpses are not that pretty. And sometimes they're not laying the way you want it to. <laughs> so <laughs> you take the body and you move it. Oh. And it's like, it's gory, it's nasty, yeah. but at the end of the day, that image has a political message behind it. Mm -hmm. And that's what Benjamin is going, this is not capturing reality, this is a different form of aura. And I think maybe I'm projecting a lot of my own views onto this Benjamin essay, but that's also theory for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you break it down, it, it, it's... You read what you want into theory. <laughs> yeah, and I'm reading what I want to read. <laughs> 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 but it, yeah, it is that thing of authenticity not being real and viewing the camera as documentary is also very problematic in this way because people look at analog photography and think, wow, mm, reality. And I say, mm, I don't think so, buddy. Because it, even old-timey daguerreotypes are manipulated images. You have to adjust it. You have to blow up the image itself. So you get things like the 35 millimeter camera. Sure, you're taking a snapshot. It's put onto the film strip forever. When you print it, you have to adjust the lighting. You have to work with the ex like what exposed image you have. You can make it darker, you can make it brighter. You can uh, cut it out. You can make it really funky and cool. Like you have the final edit. And obviously now we have things like Photoshop and the face tuning app and all that stuff. And that is just a faster way of doing what has always already been done. And I think that's why Benjamin's essay is so particularly relevant today because mm -hmm. he's talking about the rapidness of imagery. And he's not tying it down exactly to just the medium of photography. I think he's very much aware that this advancement of technology is going to continue and it's only going to get faster. And like, I think that's why he mentioned heliography right in the beginning and all these things. He's like, this is not that long ago for him. Like, this is, what, a hundred years? And now it's almost been a hundred years since this essay. And it's it's one of those things like, wow, like, we haven't changed as a species all that much. Wow. <laughs> wow. I love doing things over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> Repeti reproduction. Um, one of the things that I kind of want to connect to this idea of photography and death, right? And not just capturing death, but actually also capturing death, right? What was it? Spectral photography. Mm -hmm. This kind of placing a former family member into your photograph. But also, I cannot remember where it is in this essay. But at one point, he starts to talk about what happens to... Say you have, you know, a picture of your grandmother right and then you pass it to your children you say this is a picture of your great grandmother but what if it gets passed along and people forget who the people in the image are and what mm -hmm. does that make the image and then there's this question of does the photograph just become a piece of art or does it become useless right and we kind of talked about like here's where the archive kind of comes in because it is one of those fascinating things in which we all have pictures, or at least hopefully, you have pictures of your family members from like early 1900s. I know some people that have family members photographed from like 1880s, even sometimes if they're very rich <laughs> earlier. And it's like, okay, so while we do not recognize these people anymore, these are valuable objects to our own personal family history. Mm. So here that authenticity changes in a really large way because then 
the object itself is the importance. I think a really good connection is what I told you about when the Americans bombed Germany. A lot of paintings no longer exist because they were destroyed in fires and I am going to say, please don't bomb places. Yeah. <laughs> this is a controversial political opinion. I don't like bombing. <laughs> but these photographs ended up being the only remnants of those original paintings. So then there's a transfer of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And that is a form of death. It's the death of the unique original object. And now the reproduction is the original which is a really wild thing to consider. I don't think Benjamin was looking that far ahead, but I think this essay is a great application of that mm -hmm. because he does start to end things with like, no, photography is an actual medium. It is a new medium. It's what we connect to it. And I personally don't see the establishment of aura in this essay. It is introduced. It has like a cold open. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think aura is furthermore discussed in other art circles a lot more and it kind of takes up a body after that but it is one of those things like what is the death of photography is there a death of photography is there something else that's going to take its shape mm -hmm. you know like now we're getting projections and like live shows mm -hmm. of dead people yeah, yeah yeah and it's just like that's not authentic <laughs> yeah. that's definitely not authentic but like i want to say there's a couple shows that try to mimic the actual singer or rapper like uh, Tupac performing next to Snoop Dogg. But then you have shows that use really cool live concepts like Frank Zappa, in which his original recordings were played, but it was actually like an art installation. So it was kind of psychedelic and stuff. So they did use his image, but they didn't use him, just him by himself. So I think that's a really good comparison, although like off the cuff. <laughs> yeah. on the death of the subject within these yeah. photographs yeah. yeah, and how they later on take on a new life. But you brought about a really interesting point about the actual archival uses of what we think as throwaway objects. One of the places that I study that's a case study for my research is the Museum of Transology. And it was originally, well, it was originally somewhere else, but <laughs> when I studied it, it was in the Brighton Museum and Art Gallery. And they collected um, objects from trans individuals. And one of the things that they kind of wanted to reject in a really interesting connection to this essay is the capitalist notion of what it means to collect, right? They didn't want to just collect expensive things. They didn't want to just collect the most, you know, valuable things. They wanted to collect real life, everyday objects. And some of the really beautiful things that they had in there was things like people's train tickets that they had kept from when they were traveling to doctor's appointments or traveling to see loved ones and then you also had old boxes of medicine so not with the medicine in them but empty boxes but i think it's really interesting this notion of somebody's trash becomes somebody's historical artifact and you know i could pick up a picture of the you know somebody could have dropped a physical photograph of people that are really important to them <laughs> but i pick it up and i go I don't know these people and this doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. to me. Or you have the opposite. I remember, um, I can't remember her name, but she was on YouTube. I think it was Graveyard Girls, something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And she used to collect photos of, I think it was specifically military men. I think she, yeah, she did collect images of military men, which is helpful for me. But there's also the usage of photography as a way to subjugate people. Mm. And that is also another connection where looting is a really popular thing mm -hmm. within war. So taking someone's memories, like a photograph, is a form of assault. This is a more neoliberal sense of assault. It's adding value to something that you don't really know. And that's where like the photograph takes on its own meaning, where it's not taking the space of painting. It's not trying to replace painting. It is its own specific thing. It can act as a form of documentary so long as we make sure to realize that this isn't real. Yeah. It is a form of reality. And it's also, you know, when you're casually taking pictures of your friends without realizing it, you're enacting your kind of reality onto mm -hmm. that person. And your perspective. Yeah, yeah, your perspective is coming through in the way you photograph, often without you realizing, maybe. I think this is where the archive is interesting, right? Because it takes sometimes some of these 
photographs that are deemed unimportant to some people and says actually no this has historical significance an abstract example that i think comes from an actual example you gave earlier not earlier in this episode earlier before we were talking if somebody took a picture of the you know the street right and then in 20 years time there's loads of buildings and it, it looks way different or something's happened to it and it looks way different that is a historical capturing of that street in that time actually it wasn't me it was benjamin <laughs> quote for this yeah, yeah. Ooh. it's a uh, quote at this point the caption must step in thereby creating a photography which literizes the relationship of life without which photographic construction would remain stuck in the approximate that is not every corner of our city a scene of action is it not each passerby an actor is it not the task of the photographer descendant of the augurs and the horses to uncover guilt and name the guilty in his pictures which is so, I mean, dramatic. I mean, it is Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin. This is why he can't be called Benjamin. This is on the last page of the essay. And I think it's one of those where he's kind of handing it off to the reader to go beyond the photograph and like use the camera as an extension of their own perspective and to have the image live on beyond that. And I think to quote him again, and I think this is one of the best quotes of all time, even though it is the not the most famous essay of his, and it is this. The illiterate of the future, it has been said, will not be the man who cannot read the alphabet, but the one who cannot take a photograph. But must we not also count as illiterate the photographer who cannot read his own pictures? Will not the caption become the most important component of the shot? And I think that basically summarizes everything we've been thinking about and considering when it comes to the afterlives of these images. What is really interesting and is mentioned in the art form version of this essay is that a couple years after this essay was published, Life magazine was created in the United States. That is one of the quotes that made me go, is he a time traveler? Like, why is he known so much? But the other quote that I think is also about captions that I think is, is interesting is, the camera will become smaller and smaller, more and more prepared to grasp fleeting secret images whose shock will bring about the mechanism of association in the viewer to a complete halt. At this point, captions must begin to function, captions which understand the photography, which turns all relations of life into literature, and which all photographic construction must remain bound in coincidences, right? Oof. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, is that not Instagram? <laughs> Is that not the little not the tracker camera? device in our pockets that we use to talk to each other on? Literally, is that not like Facebook? Even before Instagram? Yeah. Was it before Instagram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Facebook was before Instagram, MySpace right before then. Yeah, MySpace, like, this this attaching of captions to images, mm -hmm. as well as the camera getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it was like the early on versions of archival processes, like, photo bucket or something it was called mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. um this is where we're showing our advanced age of <laughs> not even hitting 30 yet <laughs> um sorry sorry listeners <laughs> jealous <laughs> but in all actuality it, it's almost like we have to attach the setting or some sort of context to our images because if not they just become lost and it's it's one of, it's so amazing how he knew that the advancement of technology was gonna become this way, and he knew it was gonna get smaller and smaller and faster and faster. Because in the t in the years that he's been alive, he saw the creation of the thirty five millimeter, mm -hmm. and then following right afterwards, film. And then during this time, film was starting to get audio. Like it, it was becoming all encompassing. Mm -hmm. and becoming something way beyond what he had imagined before. And we're kind of dealing with that now. We saw the birth of the internet. And now there's going to be people that have always grown up with the internet, like how we have always grown up with the camera. As a final point to end on, you were talking earlier about photography as a new form of language, right? Yeah. The best example I can give is how many times have you been talking to somebody and you're like, I don't want to type this out. Like, if I take a picture, it will make more sense. Mm -hmm. It will, I'll be able to convey what was happening better than I could ever 
talk to you about it, right? Yeah, but that also is the most interesting part because that means even if language can't capture it, neither can the camera. No. Because that's it goes back to like aura. It's actually quite Foucauldian, which we'll get to at some point. We'll get to Foucault, don't you worry. <laughs> but it is that way that you can't really truly describe what you're feeling and sensing mm -hmm. because words are limiting and so is the image. Yeah. People are like, pictures with the beds and birds. Yes, but those words don't mean aura. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This made sense for everyone. I, I think it's interesting to dart from place to place and, and just kind of follow the flow of what's happening. You know, we had a broad bullet point list of what we wanted to cover. Mm -hmm. We've covered it. We also stuck as closely as possible to the actual process within the essay yeah. because, as I think I mentioned earlier, the Benjamin essay starts off quite scattered and then slowly comes to a conclusion, mm -hmm. which is a really popular way that he tries to convey his thoughts. He kind of has like a giant word map of everything and then summarizes it eloquently and dares it beautifully. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, what do you mean? So, there's just like your little final book. Um, my final thoughts is I was really happy to read this essay again. I kind of let you have your general some, like feelings about it because this was the first time you were reading it. But revisiting, I feel like it gets better every single time. It's one of those that you notice more and more things within the actual text. When I first read it, I saw it as like a very blanket Marxist analysis, and it is. <laughs> yeah. Don't get, don't you get twisted? It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> but the more I read it, the more I see it is someone that is very aware of their current environment. Mm -hmm. And given the setting of the Weimar Republic and of the rising Nazi party, I think it's also a very interesting look into that time period. At the end of the day, he's questioning how things are going to exist beyond now. He's looking at a future in which things are manipulated. And I'm not saying he's like a soothsayer, but we can, we can, we can surmise a little bit of soothsaying in there. And he kind of knew something was about to happen. And it's one of those things of like aura. We can look at this and try to figure out exactly what he meant. We can never truly capture it. I love thinking about, you know, that space in between. And this isn't the only place this exists, mm -hmm. but I love it. I love it. I'm yeah. going to continue to think about it. <laughs> it was also one of those, it, it's, it's the most interesting application of Marxism I have read ever in my life. I know that there's more fascinating, much more eloquent uses of Marxism. And we'll probably read some. And we, no, and we will. Yeah, we're going to read some. <laughs> yeah, you can't escape Marx and Hegel, baby. Marx is everywhere. <laughs> Marx is everywhere. Marx is everything. Marx is life. <laughs> but I think this essay just does it in a way that is... It is challenging, mm -hmm. but it's challenging in a way that, like, you don't have to be super familiar with everything that mm -hmm. he's discussing because you can take away so much from it. So, the way we kind of want to end these episodes, <laughs> and it won't happen every time, sometimes it's going to be a connection to pop culture, mm -hmm. but sometimes we want to look up fan fiction and, and Google these people and see what comes up because... Why did we want to do this? <laughs> because of me. <laughs> so this entire segment, I like to call it, is there fan fiction? Because usually there is. Mm -hmm. And it is wild. We're not going to read the actual fan fiction aloud um, because one, sometimes it is inappropriate and not everyone who listens to us wants to hear about Hegel and Marx fan fiction, although I highly recommend. Um, but I thought it would be interesting because of I, what people do with these theories. I mean, do they apply it? No, not always. Sometimes, but not always. So we typed in Walter Benjamin yep. onto um, the beautiful archive of our own, because truly archives are our own. <laughs> and uh, we each chose what first came up. So what did you find? Oh yeah, so this one is a collection of three parts, right? Uh, by the way, this is my first time in AO3. So I did not <laughs> understand any of this, but I can cut, it's written in 
Chinese and Mandarin. So um, if you don't read that, you're not going to be able to read it. But, Google uh, Translate. Google I guess. Translate. <laughs> Google Translate it. Okay. And I can't even tell you what it's about because I don't know. But they do kiss. <laughs> is there it's, a summary? Yeah, there's a summary. So the first part has because love is always in the last glance, in the last kiss. Paris, late 1930s National Library. And then the setting changes to um, the editorial office of a left-wing newspaper in Berlin in 1931. And in the final analysis, dialectical historical materialism does not allow another possibility. Ooh! <laughs> that is I don't interesting. Know who with, but uh, I think the other person is George Lucas, the character. <laughs> so it's George Ultimate. Lucas. It's Lukash. Lukash. Not George Lucas. <laughs> George Urbix does not make us. <laughs> He's a philosopher. George Lukash. I told you I didn't know any. Why do you think we're doing this podcast? George Lucas. George Lucas. No, he has, yeah, he's a Marxist philosopher, literary historian, critic, and beautiful. Aesthetics. They have a beautiful kiss. Just spoiler alert. <laughs> <enough. laughs> I can't, I, I will not be reading this one because it is in Mandarin, we believe. Um, <laughs> my one choice, because it is in English, it is called Translator Battle Royale by Rebbe TV. It is for general audiences. But it does have graphic depictions of violence. <laughs> Characters are Lawrence Venuti, Saint Jerome, Frederick Nietzsche, Walter Benjamin, Vladimir Nobokov, <laughs> Jean Paul Venet. I'm not gonna say all these names. Um, the, the additional tags are this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever written. Done for class, Battle Royale, free form. It is a bunch of translators in a giant coliseum battling. I don't know what to tell you, man. If you found this and you're not in my translation cast, what the TF tag kind of tags you in. <laughs> and so, Rebbe TV, great points. But let me tell you a summary. He wrote, essays are no longer enough. The only way to decide which translation theory is the best is through bloodshed. Notes. This, period, was done as a final project for my translation class, period. If you're here from my profile or one of the tags, enjoy. It's a bunch of academics fighting with anime powers. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be reading this. Amazing. I love Battle Royale. And Frederick Nietzsche battling Walter Benjamin, I would love to see. Anything can happen <laughs> in fan fiction. I told yeah. you about the Lightning Queen one I read. No. We'll either. talk about it off. <laughs> <laughs> I think with that, this is a good <laughs> point to end on. Yeah, great. Um, if you enjoyed that, uh, well done. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Theoryish. We really appreciate it and would love to hear your thoughts. Check out our Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter at Theoryish underscore pod for up-to-date information. And please rate, follow, and leave a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. If you're interested in finding anything we have mentioned in the episode, please check our show notes or description to find more details. You can also contact us at theoryishpodcast at gmail.com. See you next time. Goodbye.